A topic that continually interests Scott, me and the Evolving Leader team is how leaders cope with competing demands and seemingly impossible paradoxes that morph over time in deceptive and unpredictable ways. But this is the true landscape of leadership judgment that often gets glossed over with the lure of overly simplistic, meme-like one-liners about leadership. In this show, we talk to Amy Walters Cohen, an applied psychology researcher who's written Ruthlessly Caring and Other Paradoxical Mindsets. In this conversation, we explore the rise in the forces that create what she calls the washing machine effect and the ensuing paradoxes that result. We look at five paradoxical mindsets that Amy believes will be essential for future fit leadership. So get ready to grow your capacity to hold the tensions that will define your future leadership. Welcome everyone to The Evolving Leader, the show born from the belief that we need deeper, more accountable and more human leadership to confront the world's biggest challenges. I'm John Gomes, co-host of the show, along with Emma Sinclair. Emma, how are you feeling today? Thank you, John. I am feeling productive today. I've had a good week. Um, I was also thinking about this. I'm also feeling slightly envious because I've been having some wonderful calls with people this week, but they've all been coming back from their holidays and they're looking very, very healthy. And my holiday feels a very long time ago, so it's slightly envious, I think. Uh, But also very open and intrigued, I'm going to use for our guest today. Intrigued. How are you feeling, John? I'm feeling very well, thank you. I'm feeling uh, like I'm back into the 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 kind of September uh, mindset of you know no holidays and there's not no kind of like distractions from from that. And even though I had a lovely holiday, um, I'm also feeling a little bit jealous of people who are uh, who are sort of um, just coming back from Greece or wherever. So yes, I am, I'm feeling that. But I'm also feeling um, particularly excited by our guest. I really enjoyed her book. Because today we are joined by Amy Walters Cohen. She's head of research at one of the world's largest professional networks. Amy has led applied psychology research into numerous aspects of business, including the future of leadership, digital transformation, the future of learning, hybrid working, 21st century career development, organizational cultural change and team performance in a disruptive age. She's a visiting lecturer at the University of Bath And we're here to talk about her work and her latest book, Ruthlessly Caring and Other Paradoxical Mindsets. Amy, welcome to the show. Fabin, thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, it's really great to be here and and glad to hear that you enjoyed reading the book and I'm intrigued to find out more. So how are you feeling today? I think uh, I'm probably one of those more annoying people. I've got a warm, fuzzy feeling um, of relaxation having come back from a week off last week. However, the tan still got a bit to work on. And so it was only in Kent, not somewhere as glamorous as right. Greece. But um, yeah, happy and energised and excited to be here on this podcast. That's good to hear. Before we discuss your book, can we can you talk us a little bit through your journey as an applied researcher in psychology and, and the areas that excite you most? Yeah, sure. Um, And the things I love about my job that I think you got a bit of a taster for it in the sort of introduction there is that applied research is is very varied. So you get to mix things up a lot every few months, really immerse yourself in a different topic area. Um, My background is in experimental psychology and sports psychology. So the big area that really fascinates me is is human performance. and finding ways to close that gap between what should be happening and what's actually happening in practice for various various different reasons. And in terms of the specific areas of interest, I'm always curious about well-being and how people can sustain high performance so they don't just uh, burn bright and burn out kind of once a one-hit wonder type. Um, and I'm also interested in the, the bigger shifts that are occurring, um, like hybrid working, um, for example, sort of what's the impact that that's having on people's sense of belonging and their community and the, the sort of culture of organisations um, and other sort of macro topics going on like climate change and, and the impact of AI and how they're really changing the game for leaders and organisations and what's being required and asked of them. That's a pretty big canvas to play on, isn't it? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
podcast, which is great. <laughs> this is um, you know, and and you you know, we'll we'll come back to some of the topics that that uh, you explore in your book around this. But if you go back in your career um, briefly, is there any kind of like standout moments where you know you had an aha about you know the power of the work that you were doing and the insights that it could give you? Where, where you know where where do you have moments where you really got excited? Yeah, and I think um, they sound like when you list them out and list what are you interested in, it all sounds very grand and, and very big picture. Um, but actually, the moment, I think it's very, often a lot of psychology is sort of making the obvious of what people know um, more, bringing it to the surface so that they're actually like, oh, okay, that's what's going on. And that's what you need to do dif- differently, making it so practical that it's like, okay, that's that's obvious. Um I don't, and it's and it's often the very small changes so you mentioned the career development and things and it's like okay well what is it that great career developers are do- doing and what are great career developers like as people from a research perspective and then it's it's great to have those moments when you go and present that research back and you just see it sort of resonating with people and they're being like oh, okay I recognize some of this stuff that I do do or have done and that's played out for me um, or other stuff that that I'm not really considering at the moment so again and it all sort of keeps drilling down in sort of like a rabbit hole fashion Um, so for example like one of the nuggets within the career development work was around this idea of planned happenstance that um, you do have an element of luck but ultimately what luck comes down to is being open to an opportunity that presents itself and prepared for that opportunity when it comes along Um, so you'll find that people as they reflect back on their career think oh I was very lucky to get this role but when you actually map out what happened there and what what happened to make that situation and that luck come about it was that they were proactive in doing certain things um, so that when the moment came along they were able to take advantage of that opportunity um, and yeah they just stayed open and were prepared so I think it's yeah there's and in every different area there's loads of like tiny nuggets like that that the academic world is just doing incredible things in but it hasn't been pulled across into applied practice and and so my role is really sort of bridging like what's the amazing stuff and ideas that are coming out of there and how can we distill them and then feed them back um into into the business world is where I operate at the moment. Wow, I could ask you a lot of questions around that, but um, should we should we dive into the book and then see where we go? And your your book starts by exploring um, the wide range of forces that are currently shaping the leadership landscape, uh, and suggesting that they combine to create what you call a washing machine effect. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and what you mean by a washing machine effect? Yeah, and it's funny that you pick out the washing machine effect. Um, it always, for some reason, it seems to be the thing that catches people's attention. I think it always works that way when you've got a, I don't know, an analogy or metaphor, whatever it's called, um, that it sort of sticks with people and captures their imagination. But basically, what it refers to is that you've got at least twelve global megatrends that are redefining the world of work um, and impacting all all organisations across all different sectors. And these are trends like high inequality, um, hyperconnection through social media, rapidly advancing technology, um, climate change, scarcity of natural resources, there's lots of geopolitical tension going on, aging popu- things like aging populations which people don't even think about but that's going on as well. And it's just a list of 12 different factors that are really sh- changing the game. Um, but here's the thing is that sort of reports and organisations and when we write about these things, uh, we like to bucket them into nice tidy buckets so that you've got okay, let's have a section on, in a chapter in this report on technological trends. And then we're going to cover the environmental trends. And then we're going to move on to societal trends. And then let's look at economic. And they're all like neatly categorized. Um, but the problem for leaders is that they aren't in nice tidy buckets. Um, all the trends are converging and interacting with each other at once <laughs> as you go through your day-to-day life, um, creating a sort of very, very complex and fast-changing environment. So day-to-day on the ground, um, right in the book, is that this, this field like being in a washing machine um, you get no real time to pause or take stock before it feels like the next thing's coming along and hitting you in the face and you need to adjust and adapt to it um, so you're just sort of continually churning around and being bombarded with change and and these seemingly unprecedented challenges and situations and the other where the paradoxes comes in is is that the thing about these complex environments and complex systems is that they're a hotbed of paradoxes. So leaders are increasingly having to sort of navigate paradoxes and tensions effectively, um, and the remit of what we 
expect and need leaders to do is, is sort of expanding so you, it's like okay you're going to need to deliver long-term value because of sort of there's more that you need to do for the climate change and the environment but you still need to deliver your short-term results so that's not going away we want you to encourage a sense of belonging but you still need to celebrate difference and appreciate that everyone's unique and we want you to build in structure and stability so people don't go crazy with all the change and we want you to continuously transform the business so it survives and stay relevant so there's like loads of both our intentions which aren't necessarily new um, they've sort of always been there but it's just that the presence of these paradoxes is, is really amplified um, and that embracing them is no longer nice to have for high performance it's a necessity so leaders really need to be raising their game on this yeah so the the upshot of that paradoxical environment we now live in and you know the the kind of um consequences that you were talking about you know we hear every day from leaders talking about how challenging that is but is that they need to be managing paradoxes they need paradoxical leadership your book outlines a number of these paradoxes that you think leaders need to um, uh, embrace and as you say they're not new but they're also an opportunity for massive differentiation and competitive advantage but organizations inherently like to try and get rid of paradoxes they like to try and operate in the the black and white rather than in the gray so you've got the tension between what the organization really feels comfortable with so what have you learned um about how leaders can confront those paradoxes successfully in a, in a sort of risk adverse environment I'd say like organizations prefer nothing. Um, they're sort of constructs and systems. It's the people and the, as you say, the leaders behind them and our human brains that like to make things simple and sort of deal in the black and white, the either or. Um, and it's a very natural primal response. So it's a great way of saving your brain's energy and resources, especially when you're under pressure. We all, all divert to sort of most basic sort of type of thinking. And sometimes black and white thinking is, is needed. You, sometimes you need that either or response. Um, and the thing is, when working with leaders on, on this topic, is that what I notice is how hard it is to embrace paradoxical thinking. Very quickly, um, when you're working with people, you hear, hear them start saying phrases like, oh, it's about dialing up and dialing down. And it, it's like, well, it's, n it's not about that. Um, because basically, if you're dialing something up and down, what you're doing is doing each of the minds each of the things sometimes depending on the situation um, whereas embracing paradoxes is about being both and doing both of those things in every possible situation where it's sort of most relevant like the different mindsets are more they come up in to different degrees in different situations but you want to be harnessing both of those things in in that situation um, and at an organizational level what you tend to see is this sort of pendulum swing. So you you might have one senior leader who comes in and is very focused on, okay, we get, we've got this tech transformation going on, this technology transformation, um, and what we need to achieve that is lots of discipline and lots of process. So we're going to focus on that. And then a few years later, another leader comes in and they're like, oh gosh, this is very stifling. There's no sort of innovation or creativity going on here. It's all about discipline and process. So So let's get rid of some of that discipline and process and, and swing back to innovation and creativity. Um, so whereas what you need is the business to be doing both of those things, be disciplined, be, be, have like good processes and have lots of innovation and have lots of creativity and empowerment, um, you get this sort of pendulum swing depending on where it feels the focus is most needed at that time, whereas what you need is harnessing both of, both of those tensions. But at an individual level, it's, it's slightly different. Um, particularly at senior leadership level because um, what you see is leaders becoming stuck so they have a way of of leading a way of being um, a way of approaching decisions or certain situations or interactions a sort of leadership recipe that served them really well for many years and it's got them where they are it's got them promoted um, and it's helped them be successful but the risk is that if your recipe for leadership is very one dimensional um, in a modern era of business, you, you leave yourself very exposed. Um, so one trick ponies are not going to do very well in a modern business environment. Leaders need to be adaptable. They need to have more strings to their bow to, in order to operate in this sort of more complex environment. They need to be more complex in themselves um, and raise their game to deliver all that's going on that's expected of them. So I think that's the difference. You've got organizational level more likely to be a pendulum swing. Individual level, that would be more like a Jekyll and Hyde, but it depends to be people just get stuck. And it's like, 
this is how I'm going to do things. This is how I know what will work. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I describe the difference. I really like the phrase you just used there, which was leaders need to be more complex in a more complex environment. And I just think I, that already makes me think, what does that look like in several years time? But um, uh, you use the word mindset and there's a, you know, obviously the focus in your book and that very first mindset of ruthlessly caring uh, in, you know, the title of your book. Uh, and that's where care and empathy and tough decisions uh, intersect. So why does this matter to be ruthlessly caring and how can leaders actually build that as a capacity for themselves? Yeah, definitely. And um, to put it again on record, the ruthlessly caring is, it's a few people have said, oh, is it, it's the title, is it? Is it the most important? No, it's just the most eye-catching from a marketing point of view. So there's nothing about ruthlessly caring that's better than the other mindsets. It's just like more, more eye-catching. But it, like at the core of this mindset, it's about, as you say, sort of leaders, being able to make the tough decisions necessary that they need to drive performance. Um, and it's about them remaining compassionate to people no matter what. Um, and, and being performance focused and sort of tough um, and compassionate is important today because for one, societal expectations uh, are shifting. Leaders in their organizations are, are under increasing scrutiny about how much empathy you're showing, how, how well are you taking care of your people? Um, yeah, are you looking after their well-being? Um, so showing genuine care and genuine compassion at all different levels of the organisation is really key. Um, and embracing a truly compassionate, people-centred approach is, is hugely important. And they've, the ruthless bit is that like there's no let-up for leaders on, on delivering results in this continuous change and transformation. Um, organisations do need to keep changing to survive um, and stay aligned to what's going on, stay relevant. Um, and inevitably, when you've got lots of change going on, that has throws up tough choices which have an impact on people. Um, and AI is, is a great example of that, which leaders are already having to sort of navigate their way through. So yeah, I think it, it's definitely a sort of super important um, t like tension for leaders to, to grapple with, and it's, it's surfacing more and more. Um, and yeah, there's a whole different ways that you can sort of build the capacity to hold that mindset in if you want me to go into that now but yeah it's definitely um there's a whole load of different skills that leaders need to to be able to juggle those two things i think that would be very helpful actually because you can intellectually understand the idea of holding you know the tension between two opposites but the actual doing of it is um is much more challenging so it'd be great to dig into that you know that methodology a little bit yeah, and it's like, as Emma said, it's that sort of complex leader in a complex time. And I think, um, I often feel like when people pick up a book, they're like hoping that it's got some straightforward answer or a simple solution that they can just roll out and it will everything will be fixed. Um, but it's it's not, I, and I say up front, it's, this isn't a paint by numbers easy solution, but I don't think it's an easy problem that leaders are grappling with. Um, and each of the mindsets as we talk through them um, here, it, you kind of get a feel for how complex they really are to get to get right. Um, and again, in the book, it's advised that you just sort of focus on a few areas and, and gradually evolve it, um, like sort of building your sort of leadership recipe more like a risotto rather than trying to tackle everything at once. Um, so just gradually trying to adjust it. And in terms of the ruthlessly caring mindset, um, to understand sort of how to hold any mindset you need to understand a bit more about the nature of paradoxes but then each chapter in the book gives you a sort of detailed walkthrough of like okay well how, how do you actually do that because I think sometimes that can be missing um, in management books it's like literally what do I need to do what skills do I need to work on um, and for ruthless it, it's a catchy word but it is basically about having that performance focus and knowing how to make tough decisions um, which often leaders can shy away from for very valid reasons and, and also there's research showing that leaders underestimate how difficult those decisions are going to be they know it's going to be tough at the sort of senior levels but they don't they underestimate how tough um, so they can you can delay making a difficult choice because you want to be considerate of people um, you can delay it because you fear being wrong um, because you don't want to come across as unfair or uncaring. Um, but the sort of road to leadership hell is paved with good intentions. And often when we think what we're doing is sort of protecting people, um, shielding our team or, or whoever from bad news or a difficult decision. Um, but in fact, as a leader, by not facing into the grit and the reality of the situation, you're basically leaving people in the dark and poorly equipped with, with a lot less time to adapt. 
um, and being blindsided really. So that's certainly not helping them. Um, and leaders are there to lead. They need to make tough choices. They need to be skilled at making tough choices. That's why they're paid more. Um, and having that performance-driven mindset is, is so key and making tough decisions is a craft in itself and a skill in itself. And in terms of the compassionate side, the caring side, um, true compassion is about far more than showing empathy. It's not just being nice, listening to people and then getting in the trench and suffering with them. Um, it's about being able to blend emotion and logic and, and supportive action. Um, so as a leader, that skill of compassion is being able to connect and empathize pe with people, sure and empathise with what they're going through and where they're at. Um, but it's not about becoming so intertwined that you're no longer able to offer the best support. And in the book, I sort of invite people to consider the, the idea of the doctor in the emergency ward. So they see numerous patients every day, day after day. But for each individual patient, they need to empathise with them, um, empathise with the fact that for that individual patient, it's probably the worst day they've ever experienced. Um, and you need, that doctor needs to be able to empathise, tolerate their di distress, so not become sort of so overwhelmed or absorbed by what that person's going through or the distress or the emotions of that. They need to stay non-judgmental about how they got into that situation or what's happened or, or sort of trying to assign blame. They need to accept the situation as it is um, and as it presents itself. And they need to find the best way to help. Now, <laughs> hopefully people's leadership experience doesn't feel like being in a doctor in an emergency ward. <laughs> That's a pretty bad state of affairs for your organisation. But in terms of compassionate skills, they are the same. Um, compassion is that balance of emotion with rational thinking and helpful action. So I think there's a lot of talk about compassionate leadership and showing empathy, but there's more that can be done around digging into okay, but what does compassion actually look like? Because um, it's not just not just being nice. That's a great example. I think I think we can all relate to what a good ER doctor looks like in that situation, um, and particularly when you're thinking about how how long they have to do that for over a you know a particular <laughs> week or whatever to be able to manage that tap paradox um, is brilliant. Um, so next we have um, your next. Um, paradox is ambitiously appreciative, which holds the tension between ambitious goals and well-being. And that might seem at first glance to be quite similar to ruthlessly caring. Can you pull apart the differences there? And, and maybe there are some overlaps, but you know, why, why is this different? Yeah, and it was a big um, fear for me that sort of loomed large as I was researching and writing the, the book. Each time I came to a new sort of mindset element and doing a new chapter, I was thinking, oh gosh, what if they all, what if they all tangle up and trip over each other and, and just blend into one thing? Um, but while I think there are some shared features across the different different mindsets, like for example, stretching goals is important in both uh, being ruthless and sort of performance focused, and it's important in, in being daring. Um, however, I, I do think that at the core heart of each mindset and, and what it speaks to is, is something different um, that leaders need to be doing. Um, and within each mindset, there's a tension that's helpful to call out um, and that they, they are slightly sort of distinct in that way. And so in terms of ambitiously appreciative and how that differs from ruthlessly caring, the ambitiously appreciative mindset is about leaders needing a, a very strong desire to an energy really to push boundaries and um, keep giving 110% to staff, keep being relentless in their nature um, and yet do, do that without burning out or burning out the, themselves or the, or the people they lead. And, and to successfully tackle the challenges that leaders are facing, as we were mentioning about the 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 mega trends and the occurring um, challenges facing society, like the systemic inequality, um, like climate change and the environment, likes of AI that's coming up, um, you need leaders who are going to be ambitious and going to be relentless um, with with what they're aiming to do. And though I don't think this is an issue for many senior leaders, I think senior leaders have lots of ambition anyway. Um, ambition is this habit of perpetual striving. Um, so it doesn't matter how much you achieve or how much you do, uh, you want to keep striving and doing more and pushing those, pushing those boundaries. Um, and where the ruthless mindset is about making tough decisions, the ambitious mindset is this ability to go all in um, and have that relentless desire, that relentless determination, that relentless passion to sort of go out there and achieve something incredible. Um, 
And like I said, for many senior leaders, that's not a problem because they're at that level. They're at the senior leadership level because they're ambitious. Um, what's difficult today, I think, is that it's very easy um, to get consumed and like into the spiral of constantly striving for more. You've got like a perfect soup of hybrid working, um, social media, ingrained capitalist values where people only feel worthy and valuable when they are productive. And productivity itself has become distorted and confused with displays of busyness. Um, so being available 24-7, um, even when you're on holidays, having back-to-back -back meetings, like all throughout the week, all throughout the day, working super late, showing that you're working harder and longer hours than anyone else, like complete dedication to your job. And work can very easily become all-consuming, and senior leaders are setting the tone and the precedent for this. Um, they are role modeling what it takes to do well here and, and, and be promoted. Um, so I think, yeah, they have a massive role to play in, in the culture that's being set and in the environment that people find themselves in, in a modern working world. Um, whereas the ambitious mindset is about like deeply pairing that ambition and willing to go 110% to achieve something incredible, whilst also working and behaving in a way that not only means that you can sustain your high performance, but also that you don't miss like key moments that matter in your life that you sort of deeply value your own well-being but not just so that you can work harder it's like well actually what, what can I get some perspective on what's going on here what moments do I re really need to show up for what can I miss in, by being blinkered into one area of my of my life and I think just having that sort of appreciation that you can pause and reflect and appreciate um you don't have to just keep working till you finish something. You can celebrate the progress and the small wins along the road. So I think there's a whole different way that appreciation plays out. Um, and it's very, very, very different to the skill of showing compassion, um, this ability to pause, to reflect, to appreciate when something's gone well, maybe if you haven't even finished yet, um, and appreciate, step back and get perspective on your work, get perspective on your work goals, and um, get perspective on what is it that actually really matters in, in life. Because it definitely shouldn't be just one thing that's going on. Have you got any examples or scenarios where that plays out really well? Because that's a really hard thing to sort of get a really great balance of being able to appreciate yourself and your well-being and enabling that for a stronger performance. From a personal perspective, it was something that I was very aware of I actually got challenged on this the other day by one of my colleagues um, and they were like well you've written this book about how you shouldn't give everything to your work and yet I know for a fact that you spent three years of your life locked next to your laptop when everyone else was out of lockdown you were still there writing working giving everything to this project um, and how do you reconcile that with yourself because you've just written a book about how that's not don't do that <laughs> and I think um what I learned is that some, you can set an ambitious goal, um, but it was interesting in the reading, there's this thing called harmonious passion. So you need to know that what you're working for, you're still in control of how much that's taking up your life. And I think um, with the book project and any author will know how absorbing and how much time and sacrifice it takes to, to do something like that. But A, there was an end point. So I knew that it wasn't going to be how I work forever um, it's just weekends <laughs> annual leave whatever I had to throw at it um, but also this idea that you don't ha if you if you wait to the end of that project um, to celebrate you're just never gonna you're never gonna get there because you will you will just run out of steam and run out of energy and run out of motivation um, so I really learned to sort of appreciate the small wins appreciate the little victories however small they might be um, as you go through and and recognizing that yes it seems very important and I need to be focused on it but there are other things in my life that are also important and they deserve time too and with um, the leader especially that I interviewed in the book around this mindset and how, how it played out for him he was like very honest and it seems like a lot of leaders I speak to actually they kind of wait for something to happen to have that oh gosh, that sort of sit up reflection of like, w what am I prioritizing in life? Um, for one leader, it was the, the death of his father. It made me think, well, how 
how much time am I spending with my with my family? Other leaders I've spoken to have said, you know what, I can't even tell you where my kid went to nursery. Um, so that whole sort of patch of his family life was just missing for him. He, he just wasn't in touch with it. Um, other leaders that I've sort of known more personally, they seemed to only stop when they had a massive sort of cycle accident. And again, another wake up call of like, okay, what am I really prioritizing here? Am I just go, go, go all the time with no time to pause? Um, so I think, it, yeah, it's lead, I think it ho hopefully resonate with senior leaders and, and performers in all different domains, this drive to keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, but you don't want to be paused from that by something outside of your control. Um, that's like an unpleasant wake up call. I think it's can can you give yourself that kind of wake up call? Like how much and pay attention to the indicators that suggest that you might be on a more negative track of um I think it's unharmonious passion or unhealthy passion, I can't remember what I termed it. <laughs> but um are you going that way or is is what you're doing still sustainable and are you able to push through either continuously or until that end goal that you've reached without missing out on too much? Should we, should we do the third mindset? Politically virtuous. Uh, so this is about being politically aware and having integrity. So how do leaders, um, you know, keep from being overwhelmed by politics? And how can they do the right thing? Yeah, and um, that question around how do you use politics but not get overwhelmed by it, I think is really fascinating. And politics is basically about influence. Um, it's about who gets what, when and how. Um, the unwritten game going on behind how things are getting done. And the more senior leaders rise up the ranks, the more politics is going to be coming into play. And this is, again, it's something that's not new. <laughs> this isn't news. It's always been true. Politics and leadership inevitably go hand in hand. Um, and in fact, political skill is the strongest predictor of job performance over and above intelligence and personality. So it's really vital that um, leaders and individuals em embrace political savvy and political skill. And though it's, it's also messy, so leaders today are operating in an environment where there's intense pressure to do the right thing, um, whether that's in relation to climate action or sort of AI or taking a stand on a societal movement that's going on. There's a lot of pressure on leaders to do the right thing first time round, um, often in the face of something unprecedented that they've not really had to tackle before. And with social media, if you don't make that good decision, the punishment is going to be severe, cancel culture, cancel culture even, and the demand for your head and <laughs> your career is, is very strong um, when, you, when you get it wrong. So in terms of both being politically savvy, so sort of navigating the reality and the, the complexity of situations and making practical compromises as, as and when you need to, and being virtuous, so being able to do the right thing at the first opportunity, that's really, really difficult. Um, and like all, all the different mindsets, there's loads of different skills that leaders need to, to master. Um, but in response to your question of like, how do leaders keep from, from being overwhelmed by politics and how do they do the right thing? I'd say two things. Um, so one is keep a close eye on your motivations. Power is incredibly seductive. Um, it's normally hard won and then very easy to get attached to. <laughs> so to do the right thing, leaders need to keep a check on well, what's driving my behavior, what's driving my choices. Um, am I acting to protect power, status, influence I have within a system? Or am I still focused on what's the bigger picture here? What did I originally aim to get my power to achieve? What what meaningful sort of positive change was I trying to trying to drive? And sec the second point is that Elizabeth um, Dutty actually wrote a fantastic book called The Compromise Trap. It's got a very old cover, but it's an amazing book and it's got some fantastic ideas in it. Um, and she distinguishes between healthy and unhealthy compromise. Um, where she points out that leaders will always need to make certain concessions and compromises and healthy compromises basically where you're going along and you're sacrificing your lower priorities for your higher ones so maybe you're putting aside personal preference on something to move along something else um, but unhealthy compromise is when you surrender your higher values for something you believe is less important and of less value and basically leaders will 
go into the trap of making unhealthy compromises when the price of doing the right thing goes up. So perhaps there's lots of pressure from shareholders to do something or not do something. Um, there might be a huge risk of sort of personal career risk going on. Um, and quickly these factors turn into, okay, I have no choice here, I've got to do this. Whilst in your gut, you kind of know mm, the decision and the action being taken here doesn't feel right. Um, but by thinking I have no choice and going along with something that you don't really feel is the right thing, it just chips away at your passion and leaves this sort of nagging doubt where you just feel there's no option. And rather than increase your power, it's diminishing it day by day because you're not standing up for what you what you believe in. It just gradually erodes that respect, that confidence, that passion that you have um, and, and your power. And you don't have to go about, if, if you see something that you don't really believe in or think is right going along, you don't have to be antagonistic about um, sort of approaching that. But leaders do need to draw a line to protect what they believe is the right thing and what they believe is the right important to do and work with people to find a better solution. I think the challenge today especially is like it's getting increasingly difficult to spot what the right thing to do is um, and yet there's a whole sort of element around ethical fading and just spotting the right thing to do first time around isn't easy and leaders will get that wrong um, but it's almost like can you hark back and think okay we, I might have made the wrong decision there, but I stuck to what I thought was right and followed a process that I would stick to. It just so happens that it wasn't. It turned out not to be the right decision, but I believe in the integrity by which I made it. Yeah, you must have had great fun with this particular topic, seeing as you know what's happening in the world. I mean, it's always a perennial challenge, but in the in the washing machine era, um, <laughs> that I try to identify what the right thing to do is with all these competing interests and the echo chambers on social media and so on is, um, is remarkably difficult. Um, so w next we have a, a topic that we're particularly interested in Scott, Emma and myself, um, which is what you call confidently humble, where leaders believe in their abilities, but at the same time, they know they can't do it again. They have to harness collective intelligence. Um, that's, often hard because the education system doesn't really teach people to um, to doubt themselves you know you you're taught to to be confident and put your expertise um, out as your calling card and we haven't necessarily done a great job in helping smart people learn the self-awareness to know when they're right and when they're wrong um, so wh why is this so important right now and and what can we do to cultivate constructive doubt I'm going to offer no comment on the education system <laughs> or what it's created. Um, tactfully um, step round that one. But in terms of leadership as a mindset, it's it's notoriously difficult to cultivate um, in all different like walks of life and performance domains. Um, and people, I think, yeah, confidence is instilled as a very good thing. And it is a good thing. We all need confidence. And it has to be balanced with that humility. Um, but people often rise through the ranks and get to very senior levels for different reasons but often because they're highly talented um, and they they can deliver results um, it, unless it's very political <laughs> and they've got their through other means and networks and whatnot but generally speaking as a leader confidence is a must-have um, and particularly also in times of stress and uncertainty leaders need to be able to inspire belief and confidence otherwise you're just not going to get off the ground um, you need to get people to buy into you and, and your vision of where you're taking the team or the organization and you need to inspire that trust and belief in people in, in your ability and, and how you're going to and your vision for where you're taking things um, Similarly, though, in this like environment that we discussed, this washing machine effect, leaders aren't going to have all the answers. They just won't. Um, so they need to be humble because they won't know everything and they won't have all the skills they need to get to where they need to go. So you need to be very good at harnessing the strengths and the expertise and, and the knowledge of people around you who can offer multiple perspectives and different insights. Um, the lone wolf leader simply isn't going to survive the modern age. Um, they won't be able to deliver and sustain high performance all by themselves um, with a collection of minions who are just there to implement their wishes um, and do their bidding. It's just not going to work. Um, you need to be empowering people and drawing on their, their different ideas and experiences and expertise to get, get somewhere good and get somewhere where you're aiming to be. 
Um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, confidence and humility are both important because of the level of change and ambiguity that leaders are facing and the complexity and the environment that they find themselves in. Um, did you, you also said like how do you how do you cultivate confidence and humility? I think which is another big question, but I can give a bit of a taster a taster into it. Um, and especially confidence, because you mentioned how it's like one of your, a, a big topic as well of, of interest for you. Um, and it's something I find a really fascinating topic because often, especially with confidence, we think of it as something that you either have or you don't. Um, but actually, it's very, very specific. So you have confidence in specific areas and specific domains. Um, you might be very confident riding a bike, but not painting a picture or singing a song in front of a lot of people. Um, so it's specific to what you're doing and it's also very very fragile um it's not something that you can build and then have no matter sort of how much you're focusing on what one thing um as i think it was olympic medalist mia ham explained she was like confidence is a day-to-day -day issue so even for top athletes who are being focused on being the best in a defined sport um they have to constantly nurture and cultivate their confidence um so they need to sort of dissociate the feelings from actions. So focus on controlling their actions rather than letting their thoughts and feelings dictate what they do. They need to practice. Um, so basically, if you don't, you don't deserve confidence if you in something that you don't do. I don't deserve to have any confidence in singing because I don't do it. I don't practice it. Um, if you want to be confident in something, you have to invest time in it. You have to practice. You have to hone your skill. Um, and that applies to all different types of skills. Um, and finally, confidence is, is very much about focus. So are you focusing on the task at hand and what you'll notice about people who appear confident um, or pe appear like, oh, this person seems very confident, lots of charisma, sort of good at managing a room or whatever it might be. Um, they're very, very present and fully in the moment and focused with their full attention on a task. So again, that's something you can work on and practice and, and think about, think about consciously. And just to sort of one more point on why confidence matters, I think there's a lot out there about the prevalence of senior leaders, especially feeling some form of imposter syndrome, um, which I find really interesting. It's sort of believing that you've got somewhere by extraordinary luck or effort, and it's incredibly unhealthy and unhelpful, um, and it can spiral into sort of very unhealthy thinking habits and patterns. Um, so putting in the hard yards to cultivate confidence I think is hugely important uh, and can be can be life-changing so that's a really helpful um, way to start breaking down the topic I think there's one the other, on the other side of it the humility and the, the kind of ability to question yourself um, when you raise that topic for a lot of people they leap straight to self-doubt as opposed to a kind of positive form of, of, of um, questioning themselves yeah, so in terms of humility, we could sort of do a whole podcast on humility alone. And it, in the book, I focus on intellectual humility, which is about a willingness to recognise that your knowledge and your skills and your understanding is imperfect. Um, and others possess, possess different strengths and, and different knowledge. And that at any point in time, humility is about appreciating that your beliefs or your understanding or what you you know to, or believe to be true may be complete incomplete inaccurate or or out of date and to embrace a humble mindset what leaders really need to do is accept that there are holes in what in what they know um so often in situations when we're sort of there's a topic that we sort of know but we don't really then research shows what we tend to do is reach around so we reach for something that might be slightly linked but isn't really rather than thinking okay well there's just a gap in what I know here and I'm going to be curious and and explore that and see understand more um humility is also about showing vulnerability which Brené Brown's done some amazing stuff in in this area um, and acknowledging that you sort of don't have all the answers and being able to really admit that you you are sometimes wrong <laughs> and like yeah you just don't have all the answers that are needed and and you do get stuff wrong and, and do you make mistakes and, and being able to sort of openly own those um 
And then so finally just being able to be open and embrace difference and different knowledge, different ideas, different perspectives. Um, often we like to surround ourselves with people who are like us, who um, think like us, who see the world as we do, who have the same experience as we have. Um, and what you end up with is in an echo chamber with no new ideas or no new knowledge or no new perspectives coming in. Um, so cultivating humility and the skill of humility is another big topic that you don't just want to think like, oh, I understand what that word is. So I, th I think I can, I am humble enough. It's like, are, we, are you really skilled at humility? Um, because if, if you want to push the boundaries and go beyond what's been done before you, and achieve cool things, you're going to need a humble mindset to get there. You won't be able to do that on your own. Shall we move to your final mindset. Thank you, Amy, for uh, walking us through all of these. So your very final one here is responsibly daring. And that's balancing pragmatism with vision, creativity and taking risks. And I think um, definitely in my experience, most organisations are pretty much designed to prevent some of this happening and people adopting this mindset. So can you perhaps summarise some skills for uh, leaders out there to perhaps challenge that status quo and adopt that mindset? Definitely. Uh, so to give a quick overview of that responsibly daring mindset, it's basically about leaders in the responsible side. It's about leaders not sinking the ship. Um, so they're responsible for keeping the organisation running, protecting people's livelihoods, uh, making sure that the company is being responsible both in what it's aiming to do and how it's doing it. Um, so keeping the company profitable, sort of afloat, making sure it's doing something worthwhile and, and having a positive impact on society and, in, and the environment. So that's in the terms of responsible bucket, that's like a medley of responsible requirements on leaders right there. Um, and then you pair that with the daring side. So, so you also need leaders who are bold and this sort of risk-taking entrepreneur um, in order to sustain high performance. You need leaders who are going to take on some, some of these sort of big, seemingly impossible challenges, um, who are comfortable pushing boundaries and holding their nerve with it and sort of sticking with something even when you're like I don't know that this is possible but we're going to go for it and I'm going to hold my nerve while that happens um, so they're unafraid to take risks and sort of navigate that uncharted territory as it were and there are f five skills that are in the book that sort of are linked to being responsible and there are five skills that are linked to being daring um, but you mentioned about sort of bucking the status quo and how you do that and I think it's probably more on the daring, daring side. So in terms of bucking the status quo, things that you need to be good at are setting very sort of clear, gut-grabbingly unreasonable goals. Jim Collins called this out years ago in, in Good to Great. He, I think he called them big, hairy, audacious goals. So these are things that a five-year-old kid's going to understand. Um, like, we're going to go to the moon by this date. A kid can understand that goal. It's very simple. Um, but it's that balance of where... Prudence kind of says it's, it seems unreasonable, um, but your inner drive thinks, yeah, but I think we can do it anyway. Um, so the, the, you need to be able to set a goal that's clear, time-bound, and seemingly impossible um, if you're going to be daring and, and sort of buck the status quo and, and be industry-leading in that way. You also need a lot of optimism to sort of do something when lots of people around the table are thinking, I think that's not going to happen. Um, to do anything innovative or different that's different to how it's been before. You need to be very good at, <laughs> at being optimistic and focusing on your strengths um, and what you do have rather than worrying over much about what you don't have. Um, and also fr framing problems as opportunities to find solutions to things rather than, oh, it's just a problem and we can't go beyond that. Uh, you need to be willing to fail. I think if you want to buck the status quo, you need to be willing to fail. And that's something that's talked about a lot, this notion of fail fast. And it's very easy to say, it's very gimmicky, it's very, and it's very hard to do. Um, but as a leader, sort of taking risks isn't something you can just think, yeah, I want everyone else to do that, and I'm going to play it safe because I have bigger responsibilities on my plate. Um, leaders have to be willing to take a chance and sort of be bold and, and take a chance on something. Um, and often we overestimate the sort of risk of inaction and, and things. So, and the biggest risk is sometimes not taking the risk. Um, and secondly, a good thing to bear in mind is just that failure is rarely permanent. It's often just a temporary state that you have to go through as you're progressing towards something, something else. Um, in terms of sort of bucking the status quo, you need some ability to make decision and ambiguity these days. 
Um, so you have to be able to make a decision with 65% certainty around what the right decision is. Um, you can't wait for all the stars to align on something and all the information to be perfectly well assembled in front of you for the perfect situation, the perfect choice to be made. Chances are you'll, you'll miss the boat to have done something different or, or, or buck the trend on something. Um, and you just end up deciding too little too late. So decision making and ambiguity is a whole new, well not new, but it's a whole art form that leaders really need to study and become skilled at sort of now more than ever. And then finally, the sort of culture of experimentation is really important. Um, so it's naked having one person that's just like, I'm going to buck the trend and, and disrupt the status quo and everything. You need to have a culture where um, innovation and experimentation is really encouraged. So as a leader, don't just set this bold goal and then step back and repeat some sort of meaningless phrase like, oh, it's the art of the possible. Um, whenever anyone has a chance, oh, art of the possible doesn't help anyone. Um, to deliver industry-leading work and disrupt the status quo and do something different, um, you need to ensure that there's a culture that facilitates innovation. And again, that's a whole area. Um, you can't have a system where it's painful to get even the most simplest task done. Um, you need leaders who are going to remove blockers and bottlenecks. You need investment in innovation. You need to reward people for taking risks and experimenting in, in purposeful manner. You need cross-pollination of ideas, outside ideas coming in, people across different departments working together. Um, and you sort of need a good flow of information so people know what the challenges are and what the context is. And importantly, you need to shield the resources responsible for innovation from the performance engine of the business. So sort of innovative resources need to be managed with a different logic to the resources that are driving the revenue for your business. Um, and that's really important. And again, companies don't really like doing it, but research shows time and time again that that shielding of resources is really important. So there's a whole medley of different sort of cultural levers that you really need to be able to pull to create a culture of innovation. Um, it won't emerge organically in, in a big organisation. As I think you said, big organisations organically grow to establish order, rules and routine. So if you want a culture of innovation, it's got to be cultivated by design. So Amy, um, before we bring things to a close, you, have, you started with a huge landscape and we've covered a tremendous amount of ground. And I think you know, you, you've helped any listener here to expand a little bit their brain. Um, to be able to, to encompass some of these, um, these paradoxes uh, and think differently about their leadership. Um, what's next for you? What's next for me? Well, um, <laughs> I don't want to disclose too much, but we have definitely some projects in the pipeline. Um, working a lot more collaboratively with different, different areas and different universities. Um, one area that especially you might have noticed it's come up more as I've talked is, is AI. I'm very, very interested in the impact that that's going to have on organisations and leaders and people. Um, so that's um, a strong focus for me at the moment. And you see it trickling down every time people ask me a question. I'm like, oh, but makes me think about this and this topic. Um, so I think, but I think that's just a sort of habit of research that you get very sort of super focus lens into one area um, and for me it feels like mindsets was oh that was ages ago but there's still loads loads more to sort of extract and share about about that topic but I'm um, definitely excited about some of the other projects we've got in got in the pipeline and projects we've got lined up so excellent well on behalf of Emma and myself thank you so much we've really enjoyed this conversation and to our listeners remember the world is evolving are you 